Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here today. Otherwise, I'd be talking to myself. And that'd be kind of weird. Uh, my name's Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Verse by Verse, and I get the privilege of bringing the message this morning. Uh, we're going to take a short break uh, in the book of Matthew while John and his family enjoy a, a few days off. And uh, we're going to be back in the book of Matthew next week where we plan to be in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. So it'll be a great message. Um, when John let me know that, uh, that I'd be covering him for a Sunday, one of the challenges for me is it often is, is just um, deciding where in the text that we ought to camp for that one week. Um, I mean, like when you're going systematically through a particular book of the Bible and you're asked to, to step out of that for one week, we want to be careful to avoid like grinding the gears, so to speak, uh, and instead end up with like a smooth, natural transition to wherever it is that we're going to spend our time that morning. Um, kids, if you don't know what grinding the gears is, that's something really embarrassing that adults do when they don't know how to drive a stick shift. Um, some of you are in touch with that. Um, but when considering where we ought to camp, like for one Sunday, there's a few things to, to prayerfully consider in that process. But ultimately, what usually ends up rising to the top and that is whatever it is that God has me experiencing personally uh, at that particular time in my own life and, and what he's doing in my heart at that time. Because if I just like, if I just pull something random out of nowhere um, for a single standalone message and I try to run with that, um, if it's not something that God is actively working on in my own heart at that time, that message is probably not going to translate into profitable teaching. Um, it'll be sort of dispassionate and forced, and that's not good. So for me, what rose right to the top, what God has been working on in my own heart is this. With our very large family made up of bio children and bonus children. Zach, can we dial this back just a hair? I'm getting a little feedback up here. Just a half a hair. So with our, our very large family um, made up of bio children and bonus children, uh, with several teenagers, uh, one very sassy toddler, a um, couple golden retrievers, a couple goldfish, so pray for me, um, I find that I am regularly being confronted with experiences and situations uh, that reveal to me just how broken and self-centered and, and sinful I am as a man. I mean, I don't know of anything that reveals your own depravity to you uh, quite like being the dad or a dad, let alone the dad of multiple teenagers. I mean, I'm going to be 50 years old this year, and, and I thought... Like, I thought I had a grip on this whole adulting thing. Like, I thought I knew who I was as a man and as a husband and as a father. But if this last year has taught me anything, it's taught me that aside from me being uh, deeply loved of God and, and having a tremendous amount of rest in his sovereignty, 
Aside from that, it's, this last year has taught me that I, I really don't know jack squat. I just don't. And that journey that God has all of us on as men, I'm learning that he never just like leaves us there for a period of time and is like, man, you know what, Mike? Like you've crushed the last 49 years or so, so I'm just going to leave you alone for a while before I need you to grow again. That's not how it works. God is never done shaping us and refining and transforming us in the likeness of Jesus Christ on this side of the resurrection. So men, when you are blessed enough to regularly be confronted with your own depravity, and if you have children, you know how they play a very important role in that. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> and when you face that depravity, you come to understand that you're always learning, you're always growing, you're always repenting. And with Father's Day coming up next week, it seemed like a no-brainer to me that this might be a good time for us to just pause for a moment and take a deep breath and look at Ephesians 5 together. So that's where we're going to be camping out this morning if you want to turn there. Because the tail end of Ephesians chapter 5 is where the Spirit of God divinely inspires the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Ephesus to, to set the bar, to set the biblical standard for what it means to be a man. Specifically in that context, what it means to be a husband. You see, just like the dudes back in, in ancient Ephesus, we've got all these ideas out there today on what we think it means to be a man. For example, we've got the classic uh, masculine macho narrative that tells us that being a man is all about beards and biceps and bacon. <laughs> Guns, girls, and gearheads. It's all about exercising dominance and imposing your will, like conquer and dominate because I'm a man and it's a man's world. And if you don't like it, you can go sit in the corner and have a good cry with your mommy. And sensitivity and selflessness and surrender have little to no place in that narrative. We know some people like this, right? And all the way on the other end of the spectrum, there's the narrative of the ultra-sensitive, ultra-soft, modern man. Now, these are the guys who exercise almost zero assertiveness or macho masculinity. Like, these are the, the skinny jean-wearing, HGTV channel-watching Lady Gaga fanboys, right? <laughs> and their medicine cabinets are, are usually stocked with expensive face creams and man bun accessories. <laughs> Kristen, no offense, I'm not coming after you on that, so... <laughs> Yeah. So we've got both extremes out there and just about everything in between regarding on um, what a man, what, what a husband, what a father is supposed to be. And while one side, one side is telling the men to like man up and, and walk it off, the other side is telling men that masculinity is toxic and they ought to be more soft and effeminate. So who's right? Well, when you frame it in that context with those two opposing narratives on either side of the pendulum, no one's right. And we'll see in the text this morning that we're going to dive into that ultra-masculinity or ultra-sensitivity has nothing to do with being the kind of man that we read about in Ephesians 5. Now, there's something I want to say before we get started this morning. There's not a person in this room today who doesn't need to hear what God has to say about this issue in the scriptures. Whether you're 11 years old or, or 80, whether you're single or married or divorced, whether you've got kids or don't, whether you're a man or a woman. Ladies, this message is for you too, because especially the single ladies here this morning, because if in your youth, if in your singleness, if you don't have a good understanding of what the Bible says concerning the kind of man that you want to be on the lookout for, 
chances are pretty fair that you might find yourself settling for some sort of Peter Pan who's going to be more in love with his Xbox or his Star Wars collectibles or more in love with his muscle car or his boat than he is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And trust me, you don't want that. So ladies, don't check out on me. This message is for you too. Just a couple more comments before we dig into the text this morning. Um, guys, the purpose of this message is, is not, not to beat you up. I'm not going to go all Mark Driscoll on you up here. So just take a deep breath, okay? Let it out. The purpose of this message is to build you up. The purpose of this message is not to beat you up, it's to build you up and encourage you and exhort you. This is, this text here that we're going to read is an invitation into God's best for you, which is to say that it's an invitation into delight, both for you and your family. This isn't straighten up and fly right, otherwise you're not a man. The exhortation we'll get to here in just a minute in Ephesians 5 is simply an invitation into more. There is more. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Men, we're going to do some sharpening here this morning. So ladies, keep your elbows to yourself. <laughs> and Deb, remember, I can see when you kick Leonard, so... So let's get started together. We're going to jump in at Ephesians 5, uh, starting at verse 25, and we're going to take it to 33. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to read this straight through all the way, uh, and then we'll back up a bit, and uh, we'll look at some of the finer points of this passage. So if you've ever been to a wedding ceremony, you're going to recognize this text, classic wedding text, Ephesians 5, 25 to 33. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are parts of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, as for you individually, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So here in Ephesians 5, this is where the Apostle Paul continues to instruct the church at Ephesus concerning Christian conduct and how they are to be imitators of God. It's not so that they can earn favor or merit with God because if you are in Christ Jesus, you already have that favor and that merit because of the work that Christ alone has done on your behalf. So he's writing to the church here. He's talking to saved men. So this isn't performance for the purpose of salvation. Paul is simply showing us the program that God has laid out for us as men, and that program leads to flourishing and delight. And back up in verse 22, uh, before we got to 25, back in 22, Paul begins writing to wives and husbands, and first he addresses the women, and then where we just started reading in verse 25, he starts to address the men. And right there at the top of verse 25, Paul tells these dudes, husbands, love your wives. And the word that he uses for love there is agapeo. Agapeo, this is agape. And agape is a sacrificial love. 
It is the love with which God loves us. It's what Christ did on the cross, agape. It's a selfless and sacrificial love that seeks the welfare of its beloved over its own. And I think it's also important to point out that this love that he's speaking of here, this, this love is to be a continuous action, an ongoing action. So this isn't like one and done. So when he writes, husbands, love your wives, he's not talking about romantic love. This isn't eros, this is agapeo. So the Apostle Paul isn't telling the husbands at Ephesus to, to go home and, and scatter rose petals on the floor and splash on some aqua velva and put on the Barry White 8-track. No, he's talking about sacrificial love, something much deeper, something more meaningful and profound than romantic love. Agapeo is a love that communicates and expresses a desire for the highest good of the other person. And he's telling these men to love their wives with their highest good in mind and to keep on loving them in that way. Love her, love her with her highest good in mind, keep on loving her. And now here in the second half of verse 25, we begin to see what that kind of love is supposed to look like. And here it is. Just as Christ also loved Agapeo, the church, and gave himself up for her. So what's Paul saying here? Well, he's saying, fellas, if you want to know what your love for your bride is supposed to look like, you look at how Jesus Christ loved his bride, the church. And just how, pray tell, did Christ love the church? How did he give himself up for her? Well, he died now, didn't he? He died. Early on in our marriage, um, usually when I would express not wanting to do something, uh, that my wife Mary was wanting me to do. Uh, she was fond of then saying to me, you know, Christ died for his bride. <laughs> so honey, you'll be happy to know that's actually my first point this morning. Men die. Men die. Honey, you've been right all these years. Now, ladies, before you start emailing Cal or Clayton to take out an extra life insurance policy on your man, let me explain what I mean by that. Yes, we will, in fact, one day die a physical death. The lungs will stop bringing in oxygen, the heart will stop pumping blood, and the brain waves will eventually stop. And we're going to flatline, every one of us. But the physical act of death isn't the measure of a man, though, is it? Because if physical death alone is the bar, like the biblical measure of what a man should be, then we're all in, right? Because we're all going to die. But physical death alone is not the measure. Now, the real measure of a man can be found in what he is dying for and dying to. The real measure of a man can be found in what he is dying for and dying to. And we see this right here in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That word gave there is paradidomi in the Greek. And it means to surrender, to, to yield up, to entrust, transmit, and give over. Christ gave paradidomy. He trusted, he yielded, and gave and transmitted himself on behalf of his bride. So when we are told as men 
to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, we're not being exhorted to some sort of romantic or emotional or sentimental love. Those are all nice things that are vital for a healthy relationship, but that's not the kind of love we're being exhorted to here in this text. We are being told to love in the way that Christ demonstrated his love for his bride, the church. Dying to self for the highest good of the other person. Is that not what Christ has done for each one of us here today? Giving of himself, giving all of himself for the sake of his bride? removing our sin and transmitting his righteousness upon us. We're going to see down in uh, verse 28 how this plays out. But first, the Apostle Paul wants us to understand as men just why we'd want to do this. Why should we die? What purpose is there in that invitation? Continuing on with verse 26. so that he might sanctify her. Underline that word sanctify. Having cleansed her by the washing of water. And I want you to underline this next phrase. With the word. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Well, what does that do? that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy, set apart, and blameless. That word for sanctify in that text in the Greek, that's hagiadzo, and it means to make holy, to ceremonially purify, to venerate. Having cleansed her by the washing of water, with the word. Which takes us to our second point this morning. Men lead. Men lead. We are to lead in the area of spiritual growth in our homes. We are to set the tone and lead by example. Sadly, this is where so many of us men fall short. Like I've seen this time and time again in my own life, and I've seen it time and time again in the lives of dudes in the church. Like for whatever reason, like fear, apathy, laziness, sometimes we fail to fully live into our God-given role in the home, where we encourage and provide a sanctification-rich, a nutrient-rich environment for our wife and for our family. We sometimes relegate our kingdom responsibility as men to the church, to the children's ministry director, to the youth pastor, sometimes even just right over to our wife. Now, this doesn't mean that ladies don't have any responsibility in their own spiritual growth, because they do. That's not what this text is saying. But the Bible makes it very clear that men in particular have a very specific role to fill when it comes to the spiritual tone and temperature of the home. And I get it, like, I've done this. I'm guilty of this. But brothers, this is not a call to guilt and shame and condemnation. Again, this is an invitation into more. An invitation into all that God has for us as men. There is better. I've seen this over and over again in my own life and in guys in the church, like just absent, passive, milk toast men 
behaving like boys when it comes to washing their wives with the water of the word. If you don't know what milk toast is, I think we've got a picture. There it is. That's milk toast. Pretty gross. Flat, soggy, and pale. When I don't exercise biblical kingdom leadership in my home, when I don't lead my wife and my children, when I continue to neglect or reject altogether God's invitation to help provide a sanctification-rich environment for my bride and for my family, where the word of God is held up regularly in high regard. When I take that God-given responsibility and I just hand it over to other people or hand it over to other programs or, or leave it to my wife, spiritual, emotional, and relational dysfunction will almost always follow. When I don't wash my wife in the water of the word, when I blow off setting the example and bringing her and the kids regularly to church, when I blow off praying with her and for her, when I blow off reading scripture with her and pointing her to the scriptures and to Christ as the source of all life and vitality and delight, Spiritual, emotional, and relational dysfunction almost always follows. Men die and men lead, not as a means of earning salvation or favor, but as the path to joy and delight for ourselves and for our families. And in verse 28, this is where Paul tells us what this looks like. He says this, so husbands, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. I think it's important to point out that in verse 28 here, Paul is still using agapeo, agape, every time for that word love. So when he writes that we ought to, to love our wives as our own bodies, and he who loves his own wife loves himself, that love is the kind of love that holds up and keeps and serves the highest good of the other person. A sacrificial love for your wife. Verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are parts of his body. Nourishes and cherishes. Those are the Greek words like trepho and thalpo. Like when I think of that word nourish, like we think of food, right? Right? We think about food, like we're going to go over to Landmark Grill on, on Main Street and we're going to nourish ourselves with an olive burger. But the word for nourish here, ektrefo, that Paul is using here, carries much more meaning than merely stuffing our face. Ektrefo means to rear up to maturity, to train or to bring up. And this word... I didn't know this till this past week. This, this word is only used two times in the entire New Testament. Here in Ephesians 5.29 and later on in Ephesians 6.4 where the context is fathers training up their children. And that word for cherish that he uses, thalpo, carries the meaning of to train and invest in someone you love. Training someone you love to develop to their full potential. So while the word cherish there, thalpo brings love into that idea, the word nourish, ektrefro, brings the idea of training to maturity. 
So what the Holy Spirit would have these men and all of us understand here is that this invitation that we as men are being given and just how it is that we're to love our, our wives, he's doubling down here, he's doubling down that this is not eros, this is not phileo, brotherly love or friendly love. Those are all good things, but this is agape, which is a different kind of love altogether. This is going after the other person's highest good. Which in the context of Ephesians 5 and in the context of loving in such a way that we are making a conscious decision to regularly and continuously die to self. In the context of washing our bride in the water of the word in such a way that we lead in the area of spiritual growth. That dying in that leading That nourishing and that cherishing means that as men, as men out of our deep and profound love for our bride, that we are to help train and develop and invest in her. That she might develop and flourish to her full potential for the glory of God. Because my bride's highest good, my children's highest good, my highest good is that we would continually feed on and nourish ourselves by feasting on God's word. Not so that we would become book smart or self-righteous or religious, but that we would become Christ-like. Because if we're not after that, What are we doing here? Continuing on to verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, Paul is quoting Genesis 2.24 here to serve us by way of reminder that God's design for marriage is turning two people, one man and one woman, into one flesh or one person for a lifelong commitment. One man, one woman, one flesh. Lifelong commitment. And Paul goes even further than that down in verse 32, which we'll get to in just a minute, where he compares the marriage relationship between a man and a woman with the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. You know, I will, um, I will just readily confess to you that, like, I don't know whether uh, what I'm thinking here um, was Paul's intent when he was writing uh, verse 31. But as I look at that text, like as I read that verse, I can't help but wonder if Paul was maybe sort of going after the mama's boys a little bit. Like, I don't know if they had mama's boys back, you know, when Paul was writing this to the Ephesian church, but it sure seems like today, like in our context, that boys are trying to postpone walking across that threshold into manhood for as long as possible. We were talking about this issue uh, this past Sunday night at student ministry, and we were talking about the difference between men and boys when it comes to godly maturity. And we watched this great clip um, from a pastor named Paul Washer And addressing young men in particular, he shared quite unapologetically that if mom and dad are still paying the insurance on your car, you're a boy. And in his talk, though, he was clearly discouraging girls and boys from this idea of of casual dating. Paul Washer went on to talk about how teen boys, how when, like, they get a little money in their pocket. Well, oftentimes they're, they're spending it on a new video game or on a new pair of shoes. Now, my daughter, who's sitting back there, will readily point out that this past week that I did buy a new pair of shoes that I didn't really need. So, <laughs> and you're absolutely right, honey. 
On the other hand, he shared that when you have a teen boy who's forward thinking and intentional regarding his journey into manhood, like that kind of young man is thinking about putting money away for college or for a down payment on a house for his future wife. On a related note, I was just incredibly proud of something one of my sons did this past week, even before he had seen uh, that video clip I just told you about. He's a giver, and he's a saver, and he gives freely where he sees need because material things just don't seem to have a, a big hold on him, which I'm grateful to say. But a year or two ago, like after having saved a, a, a good deal of money, and he had earned every penny of that money doing various jobs, he, he decided that he would use a portion of that on a new game system. Now he knew that was something I advised against because I thought he should hang on to that money instead. But, you know, wanting him to, to learn that value and that lesson for himself, I, I allowed him to make that choice for himself. And to his credit, when he chose to buy that game system, he didn't really waste a whole lot of time on his use of it. And he was generally pretty careful about it. Well, fast forward a year or two, my son, along with some of his other siblings, was seeing how that game system that he had purchased with his own money, how it was having a negative impact on one of his other siblings. He saw like the dark hold and, and the grip that it had on them. And last week, in a moment of great clarity and resolve, my son took his expensive game system that he had worked so hard earning the money for. And he didn't give it away. He didn't sell it. He didn't trade it in for, for something else because he didn't want it to be a stumbling block for anyone else, even if he didn't know them. He took it outside and smashed it with a baseball bat. His older brother had to help him a little bit, <laughs> but he smashed it smashed it to bits. And before? Yeah. And before he did that, and we've actually got it on video, before he did that, he said, I've wasted so much of my life on this, and this thing has no eternal value. And in that moment, my teenage son took a marked and definitive step out of boyhood and into manhood. Why am I sharing this? Genesis 2.24 and Ephesians 5.31. It's kind of hard to leave mom and dad and cleave to your wife when you're still holding on to childish things. The Apostle Paul gets at this in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. I got that out of order. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now, guys, I'm not capping like games and toys and, and having fun. It's important to have fun. It's important that if you have hair to let it down once in a while. It's okay. Enjoy the good gifts of God. But there's a time to cut the cord, cleave to your wife, and leave childish things behind. Single adult males... Unless you're serving as mom or dad's primary caregiver, which is awesome if that's you, but if that's not you and, and you're just a guy who's just sort of sponging off of other people, not really making any strides toward independent living, it's probably time to put down the video game controller 
and the TV remote, pick up your Bible, get a job, and move out of mama's basement. Because men grow. Men grow. Preferably up instead of out. (laughs) Men die. Men lead. And men grow. Not to earn salvation, not to earn merit or favor. No, that's religion. You don't want that and you don't need that. The text that is before us here today at VXV is here so that as men, we might simply accept the invitation being given to us here in Ephesians 5. To step into and walk in all that God has for us as sons of the king. This is where the party's at, guys, and you've been invited. Finally this morning, verse 32. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So here we see what I would describe as an echo of the gospel, where we see that the role of men in marriage is one that is meant to be like a ripple, like a reverberation, a model and type of what Christ has done for his bride. Like, have you ever thought about this? Like, really thought about it as men, as husbands and dads, We are literally and figuratively and metaphysically invited by the living God of the universe, of all space and time, to be an echo, to be a reverberation of the gospel in our marriages. As men, our lives, our marriages, our families are to be little ripples of the gospel, rippling out through eternity. And what possible reason... What possible reason do you think that God would have to set things up that way? Why would the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent God of the universe design all of this in such a way that the love that a man would have for his wife would be an echo of the love that Christ has for the church? I mean, in verse 32, Paul calls this a a great mystery. And the word that he uses for mystery there carries the meaning of imposed silence. Like, who am I and, and how can I speak of these things? This is too wonderful for my brain to comprehend. Well, I'll tell you why God would set it up that way. For his glory. For his glory. sought to cause us to fall down in worship. Like you're inviting me, God. You're inviting me, stupid, broken, sinful, inadequate, insecure me. You're inviting me to join you, God, and be a a signpost here in this sub-reality of space-time, pointing people, pointing the people of this age and the ages to come to your glory? Like, that's what you're inviting me to? Yes. Yes, yes and amen. That is exactly what we are being invited to as men. Men die, men lead, men grow, and God gets the glory. Men die, men lead, men grow, and God gets the glory. And just in case you've fallen asleep for the last five verses, Paul decides to recap verse 28 here in verse 33. Ephesians 5, 33. Nevertheless, as for you individually, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Ladies, God makes it clear 
that you have a very important role to play in this. And don't be deceived and let someone try and tell you that this statement here by the Apostle Paul is just like some sort of cultural characteristic of ancient Ephesus. No, that's not what this text is saying. What this text is saying is that a man is not going to come into his full potential as the spiritual leader in the home. He's not going to excel in his role with a sense of purpose and confidence if his wife is not regularly respecting him and building him up. Wives, if you want to crush your man's ability to lead, a surefire way to do that is don't respect him. Don't build him up. On the other hand, if you want to see him excel and thrive as a spiritual leader of the home, if you want to see him thrive and flourish in the role and the responsibility that God has laid out for him in the scriptures, then you find a way to pour into his strengths. Find a way to tell him how much you appreciate him. Find a way to build that man up. And you stand back and watch him flourish. Maybe you're here today and you find that you're in the same boat that I am. Like, I don't treat my wife perfectly like this all the time. I fall utterly short of dying to self and leading my family and growing for God's glory. I fall short. Or ladies, maybe your husband has declined the invitation in Ephesians 5 altogether, and he's decided to not even be here today. Or single moms, you're you're here with the kids, and you're wondering just how this invitation in Ephesians 5 to die and to lead and to grow applies to you. Like, how can I ever measure up to everything that's laid out here? Well, take a look here at what Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote to, in his letter to the church in Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians twelve nine. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For those who are in Christ Jesus, his power is made perfect in your weakness, in your shortcomings. And his grace fills in the gaps. John 1, 16 to 17, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Single moms with husbands who aren't following Christ, you keep coming. You keep coming, you keep raising your children to love the Lord and you don't stop. His grace fills in the gaps. And to the men of VXV, what the apostle Paul has laid out for us here in Ephesians 5 isn't here so that as men, like as struggling, imperfect, flawed men, this invitation isn't here so that we would wallow in shame and condemnation and guilt. What we've been presented with here today is here for our benefit so that we as men of the king would walk in all that our king has for us. That we would die and lead and grow and live 
For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. That's Mark 8, 35. And that our wife and our children and our family would reap the benefits of our obedience and our faithfulness and God would receive the glory because it was his power and his strength in us that enabled us to do those things all along. So this invitation into joy and delight and all that God has for us as men This invitation to to die to ourselves and to lead our families well and to grow to the glory of God is ultimately an invitation to live. So men of the king, will you live? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it cuts to the heart of us. Lord, I just want to pray um, for each man in this room. I pray, Lord, that you would bring Um, not condemnation, Lord, but a sense of Holy Spirit conviction for where we've fallen short, for where I've fallen short in leading my family. Lord, and I pray that you would also bring a sense of encouragement and affirmation. Lord, that we are deeply loved by you and that your grace fills in the gaps. Lord, you are so good. Help us to walk in all that you have for us as men, as children of the King, that we would do so for the glory of God. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship.